It's now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you so much, Speaker. Good morning. Speaker, my first uh, question this morning is to the Premier. You know, every day it seems like more and more public health experts are imploring the Premier to slow down the reopening of our province, to stop loosening the restrictions uh, that will help us deal with the spread of COVID-19. In fact, just yesterday, we saw a couple of prominent medical officers of health do exactly that. Uh, they're asking for the Premier to not end the stay-at-home orders and the lockdowns. The medical officer of health for Peel, uh, Lawrence Lowe, says this, I'm very, con and I quote, I'm very concerned about the tenuous situation that we find ourselves in, and Dr. Lowe was backed up by the mayor of Mississauga, Bonnie Crombie. Uh, Eileen Devilla, the medical officer of health for Toronto, says this, quote, I have never been as worried about the future as I am today. And Mayor Tory, of course, backed up uh, Dr. Davila. Dr. Davila, Dr. Lowe, Mayor Tory, Mayor Crombie are all imploring this Premier Question. to do the right thing, to slow down the reopening. Will he finally start listening to them? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. And, uh, it what we're looking at is not a reopening. We're looking at a transition back to the framework that we had before the stay-at-home order was brought forward. This is be, has been contemplated with careful thought that we need to do this very gradually, very carefully, particularly with the variants of concern in operation right now. I know that they are spreading across the province, so we have to be very, very careful. We do have the emergency break that we can bring forward in any situation, any part of Ontario where the cases are growing exponentially particularly due to the variants of concern, that will then put that region back into grey or lockdown area zone. But with respect to the comments made by Dr. Davila and Dr. Lowe, that is something that we are taking very carefully and considering very carefully. Dr. Williams is in frequent contact with both of those physicians. There is a new um, load of data that is coming in tonight. Response? It's going to determine the recommendation that Dr. Williams will be making to the government with respect to the situation for both Peel and Toronto. Question. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, Ontarians have been doing the right thing. They have been working so hard to stop the spread of COVID-19. Folks are absolutely exhausted. The last thing they need is a government that's preparing to transition us into a disaster with the third wave. The Minister of Health talks about the emergency break, and yet nobody has any details as to what that looks like. What is the criteria? Why isn't the government forthright about exactly what that uh, emergency break is all about? They refuse to do the things that we know will stop the spread of COVID-19. COVID-19, things like sick days for workers who are our essential workers that are still going to work and spreading the virus. We know that the variant of concern, the variants of concern, are are heading into Hamilton. Uh, we know that they're in Simcoe, and and those places are already coming out of lockdown. Question. Dr. Davila said this: by the time the confirmed variant case counts are big enough to shock us, it'll be too late to do anything. Why isn't the government acting now? Good health. Well, protecting the health and safety of the people of Ontario has been our number one priority since the beginning of this pandemic and always will be. And that's why we brought forward a very, very careful, thoughtful, slow transition back into the framework to protect the people of Ontario. We are very aware of the variants of concern. We are very aware that the numbers are low right now, but they can increase exponentially. And that was the purpose of the emergency break. We are looking at that on a daily basis. And if the emergency break needs to be brought forward in Peel in Toronto or any other place in Ontario, we will not hesitate to use it to protect everyone in Ontario. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, it looks like this government is just going to make the same mistake again that it's made twice already. And people are tired. They're tired of the lockdowns. We have a third wave upon us. In the UK, the third wave in one day, the third wave was worse than the second, and in one day, 1,500 people died in, in, uh, in the UK. Charles Gar Gardner, the MOH Med um, Medical Officer of Health for Muskoka District Health Unit, said this, and I quote, be fully prepared to be put back in place. Uh, 
uh, to put back in place the stay-at-home order and the shutdown. Dr. Michael Warner said this: "Quote: We're being put in a position where we're pretty mo uh, much more like where we're much more likely to see a third wave. We need to course correct. Why is the government ignoring the experts, ignoring the facts? Why is the premier prepared to yet again have people get sick, have another lockdown, overwhelm our hospitals instead of doing the right thing and slowing down the reopening?" Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and I would say uh, to the Leader of the Official Opposition through you, I'm not sure what mistakes you're talking about. Since Ontario has the lowest level of cases per 100,000 in the North America, wow. other than the Atlantic bubble, at 75 per 100,000. So clearly we are doing some things right. We also created a lab system to be able to test people. We're up to 100,000 people a day that we can can't manage. We can test uh, up to 100,000 people per day. We created all of that. We've created the Vaccine Immunization Task Force. We don't have the supply of vaccines that we need that we're waiting for from the federal government. But, but notwithstanding that, we've already administered over 500,000 vaccine shots so far. We are doing everything that we can. We are protecting the people of the province of Ontario. And if we need to bring in the emergency break across the province Response. again, we'll do it. But we are doing everything that we can to not have to do that. And we are relying on the evidence and we are relying on the medical advice from Dr. Williams and the public health measures table, which I would remind the member opposite contains at least Thank you very much. The next question, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier, and I have to say uh, that's not what we've seen here in, in, uh, in the Legislature. I mean, we came to this Legislature this week, the NDP, and put some hopeful, helpful proposals on the table to try to actually do things to help people get through COVID-19 and stop the spread. And it was shocking to see that here we are on the third day and the government has not brought forward a single action, a single action to help people get through. COVID-19. There are many things the government can and should do that experts are asking for. Things like paid sick days for workers so the spread doesn't happen in workplaces. Things like lower class sizes in schools. Speaker. Things like the, pay, the uh, four hours of hands-on care for every person that is living in long-term care. Instead, the Premier comes with threats and insults and bad behaviour. The people of Ontario Question. deserve much better than, then, than that. When will they start listening? listening to the experts and actually put in place things that will help us get through this next couple of months. Stop the clock. Member for Don Valley East will come to order. The Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry will come to order. Start the clock. Minister of Health to reply. Thank you very much, Speaker. We have taken action since the beginning of this pandemic to protect the people of the province of Ontario with expanding testing, lab capacity, case and contact management, and with respect to the variants of concern that I know Dr. Davila and Dr. Lowe are very concerned about, uh, we have started a six-point plan, which started with mandatory on-arrival testing of international travellers at Pearson Airport. Despite asking the federal government to do this for a many, many months. We finally moved that forward ourselves because that's how the variants of concern got into Ontario in the first place. We are waiting for the federal government to take further measures, but in any event, we knew it was necessary to do that screening, and we have caught over 2 percent capacity. We've caught a number of people who inadvertently have COVID-19 coming into Ontario, and they are being closely followed to make sure that we control the spread. We also Fonts? enhance screening and sequencing to identify new variants. That is something that with new testing capacity, we can now determine if people are coming in with known variants or if new variants are being determined. We've also maintained public health measures to keep people safe, strengthening case and contact management. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, just a few minutes ago, another suggestion that the NDP brought forward was shot down by this government, and that is to actually permanently increase the pay of PSWs in our province. Those folks work very hard. 
PSWs have one of the hardest jobs in Ontario, and yet they are not respected, nor are they well paid by this government. And sure, there's a temporary increase in their wages. It's going to end on March 31st. Look, the government's own study, own staffing study, showed that the PSW wages need to be increased. In fact, we've known this for a very long time, but particularly in the context of COVID-19, those workers deserve a better pay, a pay packet each and every day for the work that they do to protect our seniors in long-term care. When will the government act and permanently increase the wages of PSWs? We also recognize the incredible work that personal support workers provide in hospitals, in long-term care homes, and uh, home and community care. They are on the front lines. They come to work each and every day. They deserve our additional financial support, and that's why we have increased PSW wages, $3 an hour for eligible workers in long-term care, $3 an hour to eligible workers in home and community care, $2 an hour for eligible workers in public hospitals, and $3 per hour for eligible workers in social services, providing direct care support services for the activities of daily living. This is something that we know is very important. We know that we need to keep more PSWs. We know that we need to increase their pay. We are doing that to March 31st, at which point we will re-examine that and see what needs to be done going forward. Thank you. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the, the uh, government needs to assure PSWs that the value of their work is not going to go down suddenly on March 31st. But look, people have made tremendous sacrifices across our province. Folks have dealt with unbelievable loss, loss of loved ones, loss of businesses. Uh, it, it has been a very, very tough time. COVID-19 has really devastated our province. We saw 7,000 people uh, evicted when the government raised the eviction ban uh, last time around. We saw 355,000 people lose their jobs in 2020 because of COVID-19. 700 people lose their lives to COVID-19, 3,800 of those in long-term care. And yet the government continues to refuse to do the things that all experts are telling them they need to do. Why Question. is the government putting, why is the Premier putting uh, uh, money ahead of public health? Why are they putting lives ahead of profits and politics? Why will the government not step up and do the right thing to protect Ontarians? Minister of Health to reply. From the beginning, the health and safety of the people of Ontario have been our priority. That is what we have addressed. We have dealt with it in terms of health. We've dealt with it in terms of uh, supports for living, for housing, for every other aspect of people's lives. But with respect to health, that's been first, and we've increased our capacity greatly. We've increased our capacity to make sure that people can be cared for in hospitals. We've put over several billion dollars into doing that. We've put over $450 million into enhancing home and community care. We're working every day to increase our supports, and we're working every day to provide uh, inoculations, vaccines to every person in Ontario. Uh, I'm sure the leader of the official opposition is very well aware of the shortages and the, uh, the, the shipments that we've not received from both Pfizer and Moderna. We expect to receive significant shipments by the end of this month. That's what we've Response. been advised by the federal government, and we will be able to triple or quadruple our production of uh, immunizations at that point because we're working with each of the public health units across the province. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Premier should know, as we do on this side of the House, that frontline health care professionals, like our personal support workers, deserve much better recognition and much better pay than this government has been willing to provide. PSWs have been on the front lines, and they are frontline heroes of the disaster in long-term care from the beginning of this pandemic, Speaker. They deserve more than just a temporary pay bump. They deserve a permanent pay raise. Will the Premier support frontline workers and our motion to make the pandemic pay for personal support workers a permanent pay increase? The government House Leader, to reply. Uh, sorry. Yeah, yes, Mr. Speaker. Look, uh, as the, the Minister of Health uh, highlighted uh, just moments ago, uh, we've actually already done, uh, uh, done that in a, in, a, in a very significant way with respect to the motion that the member uh, uh, just tried to pass uh, uh, through the House. Uh, 
uh, with unanimous support, Mr. Speaker. I think I was very clear on that uh, on that yesterday that these types of motions should be dealt with by the whole, by the entire House in the proper fashion that the House uh, has put forward. If it's a good motion, it will pass. If it's not a good motion, it will fail. Uh, but uh, trying to do such things. Uh, uh, with uh, unanimous consent without the opportunity for members to have their say, I think is just wrong, uh, uh, notwithstanding the fact that, of course, that we have already made significant supports for PSWs. They are the heroes of this, Mr. Speaker, and we've continued to support them and will continue to do that. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. What PSWs need is not empty platitudes from this government. They actually need permanent pay increases. Um, the Minister and the Premier know that the pay increase is set to expire on March 31st, but the crisis in long-term care is still underway. PSWs have been lifelines for family members, residents in long-term care throughout this pandemic, but their pay bump was temporary. Speaker. The government's own staffing strategy clearly urges the government to address the compensation disparities in the sector and dr that drive the amazing staff out of this workforce. The Premier can fix this today. Will this government support passing our motion to make the pay permanent, that pay increase permanent for PSWs? And again, the government argues. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, as I just said, uh, uh, when the member the members sought unanimous consent to do that, I think I've been very clear over the last uh, number of days and since I've been in the House Leader's role that uh, the House will deal with uh, with motions like this, private members' business, in the time that is allotted for us to do so. I think it would be completely inappropriate for us to, uh, to, to be passing items through unanimous consent. I say to the member, when it is uh, her opportunity to have a bill debated or a motion debated, the House will consider it. If, it's, if it is a good motion, the House will pass it. If it is not, the House will turn it down. The next question, the member for Durham. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, governments around the world continue to work hard to respond to the wide-ranging and unprecedented impacts of COVID-19. As we continue to deal with the risks of new variants in Canada, it's important that we continue to find ways to quickly identify, manage, and monitor outbreaks of COVID-19. In my writing, Speaker, I've been really impressed with the work at Ontario Tech University, a, a recent project I learned about. They started research uh, last June in the Faculty of Science um, on the early detection of COVID-19, traces of it, uh, in wastewater. And, uh, and, and so this project has expanded. The city of Barrie is now sending samples uh, to Ontario Tech as part of it. Durham Region Public Health is sending samples. Um, and so I just wondered if the Minister of Environment, that's who my question's to, Speaker, uh, could tell the House um, what work his ministry is doing to support this kind question. of work in Ontario. Thank you. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thanks uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much, Member from Durham, for that uh, that question. Um, you know, nothing is more important than health and well-being of Ontarians, uh, and under the leadership of Premier Ford and our entire caucus, uh, we've worked hard to uh, ensure that we contain the spread of this virus. And as we continue to respond to this pandemic, Mr. Speaker, we've invested over $12 million in a new COVID-19 wastewater surveillance initiative. Monitoring wastewater for COVID-19 gives us a choice to real-time way to track the spread of the virus even before people are experiencing the symptoms, Mr. Speaker. And this initiative will help us prevent the further transmission of the virus and save lives. This data allows public health officials to take early action that could prevent further transmission, reduce the severity of outbreaks, and, again, save lives, Mr. Speaker. We hope to build on the good work that is already underway in regions across Ontario Response. and to successfully use wastewater sampling and to detect and monitor COVID-19, Mr. Speaker, throughout our communities in Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary question, the member for Durham. Thank you, Speaker. And that initiative was announced in Budget uh, 2020. And I just want to thank the minister and, and the whole government for their support of this research. I know how uh, appreciative Ontario Tech University is of that support. Uh, wastewater monitoring is a tool that's being used to identify populations at higher risk of, of outbreaks, even before we're, we're aware that an outbreak uh, is occurring. And scientists are finding that early detection, and scientists around the world are finding this, that the early detection of COVID-19, traces of it in the wastewater, may provide public health authorities with an additional detection tool. This early detection can be used in tandem 
not on, uh, in isolation, but in tandem with clinical testing and other public health data to help inform these real and complex decisions our public health units are making at, and required for the ongoing management of COVID-19. Uh, can the minister expand on the benefits of wa wastewater surveillance and how it's being used in Ontario to fight COVID-19? Well, thank, thanks again uh, for the member opposite or side to me for that, that question, Mr. Speaker. And uh, you know, wastewater monitoring has been used for uh, years by scientists and public health officials throughout the world as a non-invasive way to monitor how diseases are circulating within communities. And for example, wastewater sampling has been used internationally to monitor the surveillance of polio. Uh, our government is partnering with academic institutions in cooperation with public health units and municipalities to create an integrated uh, project that expands wastewater sampling and analysis province-wide. Along with other clinical and public health data, wastewater sampling results can help local public health units identify hot spots for the virus and can inform decisions on where and how to mobilize the resources to best deal with that response. Mr. Speaker, this is an Ontario-led approach to wastewater surveillance that we can help ensure that more public health units have access to wastewater data management and enhance the ability of our public health response. agencies to provide timely responses to COVID-19 in many of our communities and continue to save lives throughout this province, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Essex. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, small businesses across the province are barely hanging on, and tragically, 10,000 businesses closed their doors forever last year. And the CFIB says that one in six business owners are considering permanently closing their doors this year. But again, here today, this government voted against a small business support package, voting instead to leave those businesses in the lurch. Speaker, through you to the Premier, Main Street businesses need help today, and they are going to need it fast to survive the third wave uh, that is inevitable in this province. Speaker, why won't the government give it to them? The parliamentary assistant and member for Willowdale. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the member opposite bringing up a very important issue. We recognize how difficult this pandemic has been on small businesses, and running a small business is hard at the best of times, let alone during this very difficult time. And that's why our government has been there for small businesses from the beginning with a series of supports in conjunction with multiple levels of government. Most recently, Mr. Speaker, $1.4 billion allocated to the Small Business Support Grant Program. I'm proud to say that over 55,000 businesses have received money in hand of up to $20,000 a piece. Speaker, that's $755 million in direct supports for businesses who were forced to shut down as a result of uh, rising COVID-19 numbers. Speaker, We understand that there is more to be done, and I look forward to presenting uh, to honour before March 31st of this year our, our budget for further supports for small businesses. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank Back you very much, Speaker. Presses. Thank you, Speaker. If businesses do end up surviving the crisis, it's going to be in spite of this Conservative government, uh, not because of them or anything uh, that they did or pretend to do. Last year, Speaker, the Premier failed to give businesses rent relief or bring in an eviction a ban, letting Main Street shops across the province go under for good. He ignored calls for grants and direct supports, instead telling businesses that their only option was to take on more debt and just hope for the best. Speaker, again to the Premier, businesses, business owners need more than a hope and a prayer to survive, because honestly, most of them don't even have hope right now. Speaker, why won't the government join us and start fighting for small businesses today? The Parliamentary Assistant, Member for Granville, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, our government recognizes that small businesses have been severely impacted by the public health measures that we have put in place to keep Ontarians safe. And that is why we launched the Ontario Small Business Support Grant to provide a minimum of $10,000 and up to $20,000 in support of eligible small businesses. In just a few weeks, we have approved grants for over 55,000 small businesses with over $770 million to these small businesses. And, and Mr. Speaker, I work with small businesses right across. Member for York Centre will come to order. Sorry to interrupt. Member for Flamborough-Glanbrook. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I've worked with uh, small business owners right across the city of Hamilton in the uh, Leader of the Opposition's riding. They've reached out to me. They are grateful for the support that helps them weather the storm through this pandemic. Order. Mr. Speaker, this money can be used for whatever small businesses Clause. want. They may need support for paying employee wages or rent, while others may need support maintaining their inventory. It was designed to be flexible and to meet the various unique demands of individual small businesses. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Speaker, at the beginning of this month, the Scarborough ICU director was quoted, we are beyond capacity and I expect it will only get worse. Scarborough has remained a hotspot for almost a year now, with no break in the spread of the virus in our community. Hospitals are seeing whole families admitted as COVID-19 positive, and sadly, some members of the family don't make it out while others do. And you've heard that Dr. Davila said yesterday, I have never been as worried about the future as I am today. Speaker, how can the residents of Scarborough feel safe with the emergency orders ending, its chief medical officer of health so worried, and we're going headlong into a third wave of this virus with unknown variants? Shin. Deputy Premier, what are you doing to make sure that the people of Scarborough feel safe? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Well, we have, since the beginning of this pandemic, taken every step possible to protect the health and safety of all Ontarians. That being said, we recognize that there are some areas where there have been particular difficulties. We made uh, accommodations for that in allowing for things like uh, testing uh, during weekends. People walk in testing rather than to have an appointment. Mobile testing, working with local hospitals for going into neighborhoods and helping out. Working with community health centers by also having areas where we have set up uh, 1,500 isolation spots for people in situations where if they have COVID, they can then go and isolate on their own so that they don't have, they don't infect other family members. These are all steps that we're taking, recognizing that there are some areas that have particular difficulties, and that's what we want to, to do to Response. keep the variants of concern at a minimum and not overwhelm our hospital capacity. But we certainly recognize there are areas in Toronto particularly and other areas, Peel as well, where we have to pay particular attention. We are on the testing side, and I can also Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Here, back to the Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier, we need one of those isolation spots in Scarborough that is family friendly because that's one of the problems that we have. It's been 11 straight months of battling COVID 19 for Scarborough's hospitals doctors, nurses, orderlies, admittance staff, frontline workers in our healthcare system, and they are exhausted. I thank them for their compassion and for their care. And when it comes to this virus, and now with the new variants spreading in our province, there is a sense of dread that they have. They don't know what is coming through the door next. Despite loud warning bells, the stay-at-home orders are coming to an end on Monday in Toronto. Schools have already reopened. The hospital workers in Scarborough know that there's community spread. They know that these changes are going to increase their workload and that more Question. people will die. Speaker, through you to the Deputy Premier, can you tell us specifically about the genomics testing? What variants are we testing and when will you report on this to the people of Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Health, respond. First, let me say we are also very grateful for the work that's being done by all of our frontline uh, health care workers. They have been really put to the test over the last year. We're certainly aware that many of them are exhausted, that they are working extra hours, that they are putting themselves in danger as well. And we hope to be able to have the vaccines available to make sure that all of our frontline health care workers can be immunized as quickly as possible. But we are aware of the, uh, the, the stress in our hospital system capacity. That's why we've put several billion 
million into expanding spots. We've created over 3,300 new beds since this time last year. We know that we need extra spaces. Just recently, we put another $125 million into creating 500 more spots, acute care and uh, uh, medicine beds across the province to make sure that we can handle any surges in capacity. Response. But that, and that is partly with the opening of the Cordelucci Vaughan Hospital and other spaces that are being created. But we are certainly aware of the need for immunization and the screening and testing, which you're also asking about. We are testing every single sample now and screening it to Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. My question is uh, to the Solicitor General. Earlier this year, as part of the initial rollout of COVID-19 vaccines in Ontario, our government announced that those in Ontario's most remote First Nations communities would be among the first to receive a vaccine. COVID-19 poses an increased risk to these communities due to the long travel required to receive enhanced medical care. We have heard some incredibly uplifting stories about planes filled with precious cargo that were sent north as Operation Remote Immunity uh, to bring the Moderna vaccine to 32 remote and fly-in First Nations communities in Ontario. Speaker, I am sure that this is no easy feat given that many of these communities require long travel to receive this enhanced medical care. Can the minister please Question. update the House on how this project is progressing in protecting Ontario's remote communities? Thank you. The Solicitor General to respond. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the member from Ottawa, West Nepean. You know, the city of Ottawa is not the only uh, public health unit that is doing an excellent job on the vaccine rollout. Operation Remote Immunity is a truly uh, excellent example. Given the remote nature of the fly-in communities, it's wonderful to see how our teams and what they have achieved thus far. You know, around this time um, of year, we start preparing in the Solicitor General's office emergency responses for remote communities in case of flooding occurs as a result of the spring melt. We wanted to make sure that these communities were given an opportunity to be vaccinated early to ensure that potential evacuation situations weren't worsened by a possible COVID-19 infections. Working with Orange Air Ambulance, Nishnabi Aski Nation, the Ministry Response. of Natural Resources and Forestry, the Canadian Rangers, and other partners, this program is seeing amazing success. Here, here. This includes a large and diverse pool of health professionals to administer these vaccines. Our goal is to vaccinate. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, thank you to the minister for that uh, response. It is reassuring to hear about all of these partners coming together in support of this critical mission. Throughout this pandemic, we have all witnessed phenomenal teamwork from local public health care teams. For example, earlier this year in my community, the Ottawa Hospital showed tremendous leadership in the COVID vaccine rollout by piloting a project to move doses of the Pfizer BioTech COVID-19 vaccine outside the Ottawa Hospital and deliver them directly to long-term care homes. And I commend both Dr. Atchis and Cameron Love for their leadership in Ottawa on this project. The success of this community-based solution has been felt province-wide and is just one example of the success of our vaccine program. Getting the vaccines to those that cannot Question. come to the vaccine is saving lives. Could the Solicitor General offer the Legislature a little bit more detail on some early results on how Operation Remote Immunity is protecting these vulnerable communities? The Solicitor General. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm proud to say that through the great leadership and support of, Orange, of Ontario's Vaccine Distribution Task Force, Orange Air Ambulance, the Indigenous leaders such as Chief Roseanne Archibald, we are making great progress. By the numbers, I'm proud to confirm that the first doses have been completed in 12 communities with more than nine additional communities in progress. Over 7,000 first doses have been administered across 21 remote and fly-in communities. Adults in First Nations, Métis, and Inuit populations living in remote or isolated areas are among the first to receive the vaccine. Operation Remote Immunity is a great example of when we work together, even with limited supply, we are offering vaccines and getting 
communities vaccinated across Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. COVID-19 has exposed a gaping wound in the senior sector. The government has failed to deliver on the iron ring that they promised almost a year ago, and now thousands of seniors have lost their lives. Our call for a seniors advocate will help to ensure that this never happens again. And so through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, will the government pass my bill to establish the first ever seniors advocate in Ontario? The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member opposite for the question. The health and well-being of the seniors in the province of Ontario is our top priority, and I think that's been uh, illustrated by all of the actions uh, that our government has been taking. We believe that it's fundamentally uh, important as well for seniors to have a seat at the cabinet table, and that's why we've established uh, the Ministry of Seniors and Accessibility uh, to address those issues on a daily basis and ensure we're shining a spotlight on the need uh, to enhance uh, the unique challenges that come from that sector every day. And I'm proud to say that we have a very active Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. I know my cabinet colleagues will agree that uh, every opportunity Minister Cho has an opportunity to address uh, something that uh, the government is doing. He puts that lens on it, Mr. Speaker. We've announced several very important initiatives to support Response. seniors during the COVID-19 outbreak, and I'll outline some of those in the supplementary, but we are committed to ensuring that our seniors stay healthy and active members of their community. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Doorknobs were taken off of doors in retirement homes, and there was nowhere for anybody to place their complaints. I'm going to talk to you about somebody in my riding, Linda Perez. She's from my riding, and she's struggling to make sure that her father, who's suffering from dementia, has the quality of care that he deserves. Linda's father is 76. He's receiving some support, but unfortunately, some of the care is making it worse. He's been given the wrong dosage of medication. He's been subject to disrespect. And now his family is being put through the ringer, trying to find him the care and the care workers that he needs. Speaker, this is why we need a seniors advocate, to give these families hope that government will finally fix the care system for older adults in this province. And so through you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier, why is the government standing in the way of Ontario seniors getting the independent, non-partisan advocate that families are calling for? Mr. Children, Committee and Social Services. Well, thanks again, Speaker, and I can tell you there's no greater advocate for seniors in the province of Ontario than Minister Raymond Cho. Yeah, yeah. He's doing an outstanding job. He really is committed, and uh, I, I wish people could really see uh, Minister Cho in our cabinet meetings when we we're talking about these very important issues. You know, our government is committed uh, to enhancing the lives of our seniors. We've committed $16 million to the Ontario Community Support Program, ensuring that vital services are provided to vulnerable populations, including seniors, uh, when they're self-isolating. We've also invested $4.5 million in the Seniors Community Grant Program, dedica dedicated to creating uh, more supports for seniors in all of our communities across the province. We've committed $61 million in infection control measures to protect our seniors in licensed retirement homes across Ontario. Speaker. We recognize many seniors are forced to self-isolate, and that's why there are many programs uh, dedicated Response. to the mental health of our seniors as well. And I can tell you there's a free service available 24-7. If you don't know all the services that are available to you, simply call 211, Mr. Speaker. It's a free call, 24-7, over 150 language. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Don Valley East. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question today is to the Minister of Labour. Minister, your government refuses to support paid sick days. You constantly refer to it as a duplication of a federal program, but your federal counterpart in Ottawa has been on the record saying that it's not a substitute for paid sick leave, which normally falls under provincial jurisdiction. She also denied that a provincial program would be a du duplication. Minister, you have the power to put in place a provincial sick day program to protect workers, their families, and the workplace. Minister, will you reconsider your rejection of paid sick days and support one of the two bills in this House? I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor. To respond on behalf of the government, the member for Burlington and parliamentary assistant. 
Thank you so much, Speaker. Speaker, for 81 years, governments of all political stripes at all levels have recognized that the federal government is best equipped to operate and manage these employment support programs. There is no reason for this province to duplicate an existing federal program. And just to be clear, there's 73 percent unspent monies. There's 800 million waiting to be spent. It is our responsibility. Order. It is our responsibility to let people know that. They can phone, workers can phone, and uh, to the Canada Recovery and Sickness Benefit, 1 800 959 2019. It's a supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, your Premier said that the federal government should add more money to the CRSP. He actually suggested that they double it from $500 to $1,000 per month. Minister, with all due respect, your government has not invested a single dime and put cash in the hands of workers during this challenging time. Meanwhile, the federal government has made up to $49,200 available for fa a family of four during this global uh, pandemic. Other jurisdictions in Canada, uh, provinces, uh, territories have stepped up. In the Yukon, for example, a program has been put in place to rebate employers the cost of providing 10 paid sick days. Minister, will you reconsider your position for paid sick days and provide the stability, the predictability, and the protections that Ontario workers are looking for? One more time, make your comments through the chair. The response, the member for Burlington. There were two provinces that had paid sick days. They cancelled their programs once the federal supports were in place. There is no other province or territory in Canada that is looking to duplicate the federal government's 10 paid sick days. Again, people at home that are watching so we're clear, please call over to the Canada Recovery and Sickness Benefit 1-800-959-2019 so you can uh, get your $800 million that's waiting to be spent. Thank you so much. Order. Order. The next question, the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Associate Minister of Energy. We know that this pandemic has been hard hit for families, seniors, and businesses across Ontario in recent months. I've heard from many of my constituents who have struggled to make ends meet, Mr. Speaker. This is a plight felt across Canada across the world. As we look forward to a gradual and safe order to the response framework, regions across our province are wondering, I'm, and I'm asking the Minister of, Associate, the Minister of Energy, what supports are in place to help businesses, to help individuals, help them struggling to pay their electricity bills? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, please make your comments through the chair. The way you might phrase it is, Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask the minister whatever you want to say. And make the comments that way. Minister, Associate Minister of Energy. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that important question and for his incredible work on behalf of the people and businesses of Northumberland, Peterborough South. Mr. Speaker, our government acted quickly and decisively to minimize the financial burden faced by Ontarians while asking them to stay at home during the COVID emergency. We did this by holding the off-peak electricity rate to 8.5 cents per kilowatt hour starting on January 1st. This lower rate remains in effect 24 hours per day, seven days a week. Mr. Speaker, we did this to give families, small businesses, and farms stable and predictable electricity bills when they needed it the most. This rate will be in place until February 22nd as more public health regions transition back into the COVID-19 response framework. Mr. Speaker, providing this rate relief on electricity bills has helped all internal families and small businesses in a real and meaningful way as we now look forward to a safe reopening and focus on economic recovery. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. Mr. Speaker, we know the tough situation Ontarians were left in after the electricity mess the previous government left this province in. Mr. Speaker, I know that this support for electricity relief is appreciated by the people of Northumberland Peterborough South. Minister, through you, Mr. Speaker, Minister, can you inform this House about the COVID-19 Energy Assistance Program and additional supports available for businesses and individuals in Northumberland, Peterborough South, and across the province of Ontario? Thank you. 
the Associate Minister of Energy. Thank you again to the member from uh, Northumberland, Peterborough South, for the great question. We know that many small businesses have been struggling, and this is why supporting them has been an urgent priority for our government. Under our COVID-19 Energy Assistance Program, or SEEP, we have already provided help to more than 17,000 small businesses with over $35 million in payments issued so far. We have also made it easier for businesses to access this support by expanding elig eligibility criteria. Any residential, small business or registered charity customer who are behind on their electricity or natural gas bills on or after March 17, 2020 is eligible to apply for support through SEEP, and I encourage them to do so, Mr. Speaker. Under this program, small businesses and charities can receive up to $1,500 in support per regulated fuel type, whether it's electricity or natural gas. Residential customers could also receive up to $750 per fuel type. Mr. Speaker, our Response? government is proud to be helping small businesses and ratepayers in the members riding in all across Ontario recover from this extraordinary crisis and lead our economic recovery. Thank you. Next, we have the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last, my, last month, a family of 35 years old, Chris Clavers, contacted me about his horrible condition Chris had to live with at Great Griff Manor, a retirement home. Chris's family documented the conditions of his room, feces and urine in his bed and on the floor. His 12-year-old daughter was laying in the bed with him when he died. The sheets hadn't been changed in weeks. I contacted Public Health, the Retirement Home Regulatory Authority, and the Minister's office. Greatcliffe's owners had previously had their license revoked, but still run the home with a third-party operator until June 1st. How could the RHRA allow this home to have residents living in there with such awful, awful conditions? Will the Premier make the necessary changes? and ensure that the retirement home residents are actually protected and the homes are held accountable. Here, here. Thank you. First call, Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, and thanks to the member opposite uh, for the question. I know he did reach out to the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility about this issue and uh, was most appreciative uh, to hear from him. Uh, we would like to express our, our sympathies, first of all, to the families affected by the stressful situation involving the retirement home, which is owned by the Martino family, Speaker. And uh, upon learning of the alleged disturbing reports, uh, we acted quickly and reached out to the RHRA, as the member opposite uh, mentioned as well, to ensure a thorough investigation is conducted into this matter, Speaker. We've been assured by the RHRA uh, that they will not hesitate to take appropriate action to protect all residents uh, from any harm or, or risk of harm uh, that may be there. And the Canadian Red Cross has been supporting the home with infection prevention and control measures since the 5th of February, and we will continue to focus Response. on protecting the health and safety of the residents, but I thank uh, the member from Niagara Falls for raising this issue with the minister. Supplementary question. No 12-year-old daughter should have to have this, the last few moments with her father in those conditions anywhere in the province of Ontario. That's right. Back to the Premier. Chris should never have ended up at Greycliff Manor in Niagara Falls with complex medical needs. St. Joe's Hospital in Hamilton discharged Chris to Greycliff Manor Retirement Home, where they don't have the staff or the expertise to manage complex medical needs. Last year's Auto General's report noted this widespread problem in Ontario, with thousands with thousands of retirement home beds being used as alternate level of care residents. Speaker, will the Premier agree to replace the RHRA with a body that has the authority and the mandate to enforce strict regulations, ensure people are cared for in a safe, Questions? clean, needs-appropriate home in the province of Ontario? Thank you. And again, to apply, Mr. Children, uh, thanks, Speaker, and, and thanks again to the member opposite uh, for raising this very important issue. I think there is unanimity amongst all members uh, of this House uh, that the situation that the member has described is not tolerable in any way, and that's why the ministry has acted quickly uh, when it comes to a Greycliff Manor home. And uh, we don't tolerate uh, any violations of the Retirement Homes Act. 
or associated regulations. We brought in the RHRA quickly. Uh, they've been investigating here, and we look forward to uh, their findings in the review that they're conducting right now. We support the RHRA's decision of ensuring the bad actors in the retirement home sector uh, cannot continue operating, especially in this manner. And uh, the RHRA uh, had issued a management order for Gra Greycliff Manor last year. Response. And in order to revoke the license of the home by June 1st of this year, the RHRA has been doing its job by using its enforcement powers, Speaker, to make sure that licensed retirement homes are meeting the required standards set out by the province. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Guelph. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Ontarians are confused. The government doesn't have money to pay for paid sick days or long-term care staff, but it has six to ten billion dollars to build a highway that will pave over 400 acres of the Greenbelt and 2,000 acres of prime farmland to save commuters 30 seconds. Highway 413 is not only a waste of money, it threatens food and farming jobs, food security during a pandemic, and flood protection. This highway will supercharge sprawl and benefit speculators, but Ontarians will foot the bill. Speaker, will the Premier listen to farmers, listen to local elected leaders and community organizations, calling on the Premier to stop paving over the places we love by cancelling Highway 413? Government House Leader. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as the member knows, uh, just uh, just the other day, in fact, uh, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing uh, outlined uh, a, uh, a significant expansion of uh, of the Greenbelt uh, in the province of Ontario, which includes uh, uh, something that the member raised, the Paris uh, Galt Moraine, that she raised in a private member's bill. Uh, when it comes to building infrastructure in the province of Ontario, we've been very clear from the start that uh, uh, there was an infrastructure deficit that uh, that we inherited, and that we had to do our best to get people moving around, whether it's subways, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, whether it's roads and highways, we are going to make those investments, but we'll do it in a way that is respectful, obviously, Order. the environment, which is respectful and takes into consideration what we're hearing from our partners at, uh, at different levels, Mr. Speaker, and that includes this project. And the supplementary question. Speaker, of course I support expanding the Greenbelt, but no possibility of expanding the Greenbelt will cover up the government's efforts around environmental destruction. Actions speak louder than words. If the government is serious about expanding the Greenbelt, they would cancel the destruction of the Duffins Creek wetland, they would restore the power of conservation authorities, they would cancel Highway 413, they would bring back proper environmental assessments, and they would restore municipal regulation of below the water table aggregate extraction. All actions that affect the integrity of the Greenbelt. So, Speaker, Will the minister give his Greenbelt conversation a bit of credibility by committing today to cancelling Highway 413, restoring the ability of CAs to protect us from flooding, and bringing back the environmental protections that the Premier has taken away? That's a great question. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Finally, Speaker, a question about growing the Greenbelt. Fantastic. <laughs> Uh, I was uh, I was very proud yesterday, Speaker, to uh, to make a, an announcement that the government is delivering on our promise in the 2020 budget to grow the quality and the quantity of the greenbelt. And and Speaker, uh, the member opposite, uh, I would have thought would have been a little more enthusiastic because I remember uh, very clearly uh, seeing the member before he was uh, elected an MPP. Up in the up in the gallery, watching debate, and I remember talking to him about how that he wanted to put partnership over partisanship. So I'm glad that he I'm glad that we we took Order. part of his private members' bill on the Paris Gulf Marine, response added it to the consultation because I believe, as as members of this house believe, that we can make some some good gains as a government in growing the green belt by looking at the urban river valleys and by looking at the Paris Gulf. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay Attico. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Alston has now taken over Bombardier's operations in Thunder Bay, and Toronto still needs transit vehicles. 
There will be further layoffs at the plant unless the province stands up now and commits to funding new orders. What is this government's plan to secure those good Northern Ontario jobs at the Alston plant? The government house leader. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I'm, I'm grateful that the, the member at least uh, recognizes the, uh, the important work that this government has been doing to expand transit and transportation opportunities across the, uh, uh, the province of Ontario, including uh, the most significant uh, expansion of, uh, of subway service uh, that this province has seen since a previous Conservative government was, uh, of course, in power, Mr. Speaker. That includes the Ontario line, which, uh, which we've announced. That includes Order. the expansion of the, uh, of the subway into Scarborough. That includes uh, 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 light rail, Mr. Speaker. Of course, we will uh, always be looking at uh, not only expanding transit and transportation, but also making sure that those who supply these very important uh, pieces of the puzzle will have uh, will play a very significant role. We have uh, some of the greatest workers in the world right here in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we're able to accomplish so much when it comes to transit and transportation. I am so proud Response. of the this government is making the most significant expansion of, uh, of, uh, of public transportation in the history of this province, Mr. Speaker, and I am grateful for the member for recognizing that, and I hope she will continue to support us on these important initiatives. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. Ontario needs a real plan for economic recovery after COVID, and it needs it now. And we need more jobs now. The province can create those jobs in Thunder Bay by committing to order made in Ontario transit vehicles now. There's been a lot of talk, but not enough action. Meanwhile, hundreds of my constituents have lost their jobs. Why won't this government act now? Government House Leader. Well, Mr. Speaker, of course, uh, as I just said, we are making significant investments in transit and transportation, uh, not only across the GTA. We are waiting for some uh, some additional support from our federal partners, Mr. Speaker, uh, whether it's uh, in Hamilton or in my, across my area, uh, York Region, Mr. Speaker. We've made significant contributions. I know that the people in the surrounding areas, York Region, is prepared to make significant contributions. The City of Toronto is prepared to make significant contributions. We are waiting for that partnership agreement from the federal government, Mr. Speaker. They have said that they would come to the table in the last election. They said they would come to the table. We're still waiting for them to come to the table and sign off so that we can continue the massive expansion. She is absolutely correct, Mr. Speaker. These types of investments not only benefit uh, local communities, but they benefit the people across the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. I know just to segue a little bit, the member for Sarnia was talking about Line 5 in Enbridge. These are all things that come together to keep people of the province of Ontario working. We should be proud of our workers, and this government will do everything that we can to save, protect, and enhance those jobs, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. And we all knew that address addressing the critical staffing shortage in long-term care was the most important thing we could do to protect all residents in long-term care from the second wave. And in September, the government announced $14 million to train and recruit PSWs. And then in January, we learned that the government set aside $42 million for security guards in long-term care. So, Speaker, through you, can the minister explain why her ministry is spending three times as much money on security guards as they are in recruiting and retraining and training PSWs? Wow. Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Long Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite uh, for the question. Uh, it's been very clear that staffing in long term care has been neglected for many, many years, and dozens of reports commissioned by previous governments Order. of all stripes from stakeholders, academics, and laborers have fallen on deaf ears. We are committed to increasing the quality of care. And we're doing this by investing $1.9 billion annually by 2024-25 by to create more than 27,000 new positions for PSWs and RNs, despite the empty promises of the former Liberal government. It will be our Conservative Order. government that delivers on providing an average of four hours Member for Don Valley East, come to order. The supplementary member for Don Valley East will come to order. 
Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, come to order. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Well, the minister may accuse us of neglecting. It's very clear that she is right now if she's spending three times as much money on security guards as she is on training PSWs. Wow. That's neglect. So we all knew that staffing was an issue. So last summer, when homes were begging, Speaker, begging for a plan to recruit PSWs that didn't come until September, the province of Quebec said, we need 10,000 PSWs. We need them. And you know what? They, they went out to do that, and they didn't get, get 10,000 PSWs. They only got 7,000. But that's about 7,000 more than Ontario got. Wow. So Quebec took action to address their need. And the results are clear in the per capita outbreaks being less in Quebec than they are in Ontario. So their effort, Minister, made a difference, Speaker, made a big difference. Question. So once again, Ontario is lagging behind other provinces. So one more time, can the minister explain why they're spending three times as money on security guards as they are on training PSWs? Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. We are the first government to understand the importance of changes that are so desperately needed in long-term care. Uh, the, the opposition had the opportunity to support staffing with Bill 124, and they voted against it. The NDP and the Liberals voted against Regulation 21020, allowing for the change of management of homes and outbreaks. It is constant that the stage was set by the inaction of order. the previous government. The NDP and the Liberals voted Ottawa against South Regulation 7720, which allows for staff to be deployed to priority areas. The NDP and the Liberals voted against Regulation 9520, allowing for homes to respond to resident care needs by streamlining reporting. Response. The NDP and Liberals voted against Regulation 14620, the one-site order that reduced travel between homes. The measures that our government took to protect our seniors. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question. The member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. It's about paid sick days. And I have to admit, it's been tough this week to sit in the chamber and listen to this government defend a failing federal program. I've heard members of this government give out the phone number. You know what the phone number should be, Speaker? It should be 1 800 useless. That's what the phone number should be. Because you have to work 50% of a week. You wait for days for the program to come. When will this government step up? Because you know who wants them to step Precise up? Speaker, government. let me tell you who wants them to step up. Jessica Carpinone, small business owner in Ottawa Centre. She is a small business that's been delivering paid sick days to her workers since 2013. She wants you to step up. She wants you to stop dodging and playing jurisdictional ping pong. People are getting sick. People are dying. When are you going to show a leadership role, spend some of the COVID money, COVID money given to you, and take action with a paid sick day program now? And perhaps for the last time today, I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair. Member for Burlington to respond. Parliament. You know what stepping up is? Stepping up is when we negotiated a historic $1.1 billion federal program that workers get 10 paid sick days. I noticed when I talked about the $800 million waiting to be spent, everybody over there, their jaws drop. But what, let me just be clear. There's 110,000 Ontarians have applied. Just so we do the math together here today. To date, there's only 271 million that has been accessed. So that leaves 800 million waiting to be spent. Again, the 188 is so people's mouths don't drop Order. when they know there's $800 million Before waiting Ottawa to Center be spent. <laughs> That concludes our question period for today. Point of order. Point of order. Government. Uh, yes, Speaker. Just in accordance with, uh, I believe, it's Standing Order 59, uh, outline the business uh, for next week.
On uh, Monday morning, uh, February 22nd, uh, we will begin with ballot item number 49, standing in the name of uh, the member for Mississauga Streetsville. Uh, and we will continue on in the afternoon with uh, Bill 245, Accelerating Access to Justice Act. Tuesday, February 23rd, in the morning, we will uh, continue on with Bill 238, the Workplace Safety and Insurance Amendment Act. In the afternoon, Bill 245, Elec uh, Accelerating Access to Justice Act. Uh, and in the evening, PMB uh, standing in the name of the member for Perry Sound, Muskoka, Bill 228, keeping polystyrene out of Ontario's lakes and rivers. Uh, on Wednesday in the morning, we will continue with Bill 245, Accelerating Access to Justice Act. In the, in the afternoon, Government uh, Notice of Motion Number 101 and PMB uh, ballot item uh, 51 uh, from the member for York South Weston. Um, I believe that's a, a COVID-19 strategy. Uh, on Thursday, February 25th, in the morning of uh, in the morning, Bill 245, Accelerating Access to Justice Act. In the afternoon, there will be a take note debate, uh, Mr. Speaker, on uh, line five, on P uh, in the PMB ballot item number. Uh, 52, uh, standing in the name of the member for London West. Uh, it's unknown at this time what that uh, what the member will be bringing forward. We anxiously await some indication from the member as to what she will be debating on that day. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> member for York Centre has a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. I'm seeking unanimous consent to move a motion without notice regarding notice. Uh, private members' public business. For York Centre is seeking the unanimous consent of the House to move a motion without notice with respect to private members' public business. Agreed? No. Heard a no. This House stands in recess until 1 p.m. <laughs>